I'm going to go ahead and open up, open us up in prayer here. So if we could all bow our heads. Dear Father God, we thank you so much for each lady that has come today. Dear Lord, I pray for our panelists as they are sharing their testimonies and their hearts with us. Dear Lord, I pray that you would fill them with your Holy Spirit and that your word and your the heart of you, Lord, would come out tonight. And dear Lord, I pray that we could all be strengthened and encouraged as we deepen our own convictions um, in regards to the topic of modesty. Amen. All right, so we live in, an, in a world of ever-changing ideas and standards and in regards to dress. It's a constantly moving target. But as we sisters think about how we make our decisions in regard to modesty, we have to make, um, how do we decide what's modest and what's not? And even though it's a very challenging subject, we think it's very important to God. So, it's a, so it should be important to us. I'm gonna go ahead and just start out by reading a couple scriptures about modesty. If you wanna follow along, it's 1 Peter 3, three through five and 1 Timothy Two, nine through 10. First Peter 3, 3 through 5 says, Do not let your adornment be merely outward, arranging the hair, wearing gold, or putting on fine apparel. Rather, let it be the hidden person of the heart with the incorruptible beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is precious in the sight of God. For in this manner, in former times, the holy women who trusted God also adorned themselves being submissive to their own husband, their own husbands. And 1 Timothy 2, 9 through 10 says, In like manner also, that women adorn themselves in modest apparel, with propriety and moderation, not with braided hair or gold or pearls or costly clothing, but which is proper for women professing godliness with good works. As we think about these scriptures, how can we ground ourselves in the principles of modesty as more and more confusion around us arises? As I read them, the thing that stands out to me is, let it be the hidden person of the heart with incorruptible beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is precious in the sight of God. As we discuss modesty and its practical applications, we must start with our hearts. We must ask ourselves, what does God want for me. Each of these sisters has a journey, and they are here to share their testimonies with us of where God has brought them in the area of modesty. I am very excited to learn with all of you how God has changed their lives, and hopefully we can all sharpen our convictions as we desire the heart of God for us. So how this is going to work is I'm going to have, we're just real quick going to have the ladies introduce themselves. I think probably everybody knows that, that knows them here, but we're just going to do a real quick introduction, and then each sister is going to share their testimony. Once their testimonies are done, we are going to take a 20-minute break, get some snacks, and then come back for the Q&A portion of it. Um, so, yeah, Laura, would you mind just starting? We're going to go this way, just give a brief introduction of yourself, and then when you're done, Becky, you can go. My name is Laura Caravilla. I'm married to Finney. I've lived here about 20 years, and we have eight children. My name is Becky Bear. I'm married to Cliff Bear. We are from Alberta, Canada, and we have been here since August and plan to be here till June-ish. I have seven children, and yeah, from here we're moving to Calgary, Alberta. I'm Erica Maleone, Matthew's wife. We have 12 children and two grandchildren. Oh, and we've been here almost 10 years. Hello, my name is Natasha Swayze. My husband is Charlton, and we have 10 children. We've been in Massachusetts for a year, and um, before we lived here, we were in Kampala, Uganda. All right, thank you. So um, each sister is going to be sharing for 10 to 15 minutes, plus or minus. I will set the clock just for reference for you guys. I'll let you know when you've reached the 15-minute mark. If you get there, if not, it's no big deal. Um, 
So we're going to go ahead and get started. Laura, um, what has your journey looked like as you have developed convictions of modesty? Yeah, for me, there were multiple strains. My testimony isn't just about modesty, but also fashion and extravagance and body image. Growing up, I went to public school, and I lived in the South, and I was raised in a family that didn't have convictions about biblical modesty. I went every week to a very liberal church, and it was a very loving place to grow up. It was a wonderful community, but the gospel was not taught. I didn't even know the basics of salvation as I grew up. And so, on the one hand, my mom did not wear as much makeup as the women around her. She didn't put a lot of emphasis on beauty, and I'm thankful for those things. But I watched a lot of TV, I watched movies, and in public school there's definitely a pecking order of popularity. It has to do with how you look, it has to do with your weight, it has to do with your clothes. And so I knew that looks mattered, and it mattered to me to be liked, to be popular, and so I remember the very first time that I realized that it would be important to me to wear designer clothes. I was in the fifth grade, and always before my mom had bought my jeans at Kmart, they were Lee jeans, and all of a sudden that was not good enough. I was 10, I wanted something better. And so my mom and I went to store after store, and I kept trying on jeans, and I would say, no, these don't fit right. These don't fit right. Of course, they all fit fine. Um, it was really that I wanted a particular brand. So finally we got to the store that had the guest jeans, tried those on, I told my mom, oh yes, these are the ones, these fit me, because I was too embarrassed to say from the beginning that that was what I wanted. It was that little triangle on the back pocket that would give me a little leg up in fifth grade popularity. So for me, that was the first instance of many of seeking um, expensive clothes and designer clothes to fit the in crowd, and so I wore exactly what everybody else did. Whatever was the fashion when I was in high school or college, that was what I wore. So during those same years, I danced in a ballet studio five days a week. And my teacher was bulimic, which is pretty common for professional dancers. She had danced professionally. Um, I watched her go through pregnancies with bulimia. Um, and I was surrounded by other girls with eating disorders. And so I was surrounded everywhere with this idea of being thinner is better. And I even watched and picked up the tactics that they use to stay underweight. So that pattern of seeking fashionable clothes to fit in continued. And my parents had the money and they had the willingness to support me in that. And so every season, fall and spring, I would spend an exorbitant amount of money on clothes and shoes. Um, by the time this all ended, I probably had 40 pairs of shoes labeled in plastic boxes to be able to find them all. Um, and as time went on, fashions became more and more revealing. I remember when like spandex became like normal in clothes. And so my clothes became more revealing too, and I became less and less modest. And there was a point at which my oldest brother, who's one of few Christians in my family, said to me, Laura, I'm worried for you. You don't know what men think. You don't know how their minds work. And this is not safe. And I thought he was just being overly protective, and so I ignored him. Um, I had a boyfriend who told me that my dress was too low cut, and I just kind of shrugged it off. I didn't really believe him. Um, at the same time, with my past, with all the emphasis on thinness, I was in my early 20s, and I became anorexic, trying to um, live up to that ideal of thinness that I saw everywhere. So I control my diet very carefully, and for three years, I weighed about 30 pounds less than I do now. I was very careful not to look sick. Only two people ever told me that they thought that I didn't look well. Most people complimented me. Um, I had a size zero figure, and like in the world that I lived in, that was an important thing. And so, in a sense, I had everything I thought I wanted. I had this perfect model thin weight. I had a huge wardrobe of designer clothes. Um, and I had all the attention that those got me from men and women, and it got me a lot of attention. Um, we live in a very sick world, and it's amazing the things that bring people's compliments and approval. But neither the clothes, nor the weight, nor the attention 
were satisfying to me. Um, I felt a lot of despair. And so ultimately, those issues, along with several others, led me to, to seek God and to say, I, I want to know what it's like to, to follow God, because this isn't working. And so for me, the changes in these areas coincided with my conversion. The first thing that changed was the eating disorder. A few months into being a Christian, I realized, like, I can't do this anymore. This doesn't make sense not to eat if God is my creator. And so I ate my first real meal that day. I even ate dessert. Um, it was a hard road, and it required a lot of support from my friends and, um, yeah, the people around me, Christians around me, to make those changes and to be okay with how I looked. Um, but within a year of that first meal, I had gained up to a healthy weight. And during that, during that year, Finney and I got married. And so my first pregnancy was also a big blessing to me because it made me see that my body has a purpose beyond how I look. And that was very healing. Um, reading the Bible and interacting with other Christians, I also saw for the first time God's call to modesty. I never even knew that was in the Bible, even though I went to church growing up. And so I sort of would have said I was modest all along. I'm from the South, and I, at least when I was growing up, people wouldn't have, I don't know anybody who would have said boldly, like, oh, I'm immodest, and I embrace that. Like, immodest was like Madonna, and I was just normal. And so it took some thinking for me to figure out, okay, well, what does it even mean to be modest? Who decides what's modest? And so I spent a lot of time reading the Bible and studying the history of clothing to try to figure out, you know, what is the standard? Is it 20 years ago? Is it 100 years ago? How do we know what's modest? I also had a lot of repenting to do over the excess and expense of my clothes. I pared down hugely, which was a lot simpler because most of my clothes didn't fit anymore. <laughs> and the ones that were, were immodest. And so I really just started over with my clothes. Um, this was not easy. I was in graduate school in Boston at the time, and to go to class for the first time, to go to the library with no makeup, and uh, modest and simple clothing was difficult. I memorized Proverbs 30, um, 31, sorry, 3130, charm is deceitful, beauty is vain, but a woman who fears the Lord is to be praised. And I would just say that to myself over and over, walking down the street to get up the courage to, to keep going in this path and give up fashion and makeup and beauty. So as time passed, I actually found a lot of freedom in living this way. I had spent years in bondage to my hair dryer. I couldn't go out without drying my hair. And just putting on a head covering was really freeing um, once I got past the shame of feeling different and strange. Likewise, I had spent years arriving late to school. My mom used to threaten all kinds of things to try to get me to go to school on time because I was always late because I would change my clothes like 10 or 15 times trying to decide what to wear to go to school. And again, it was really freeing to say, okay, I have a few dresses, a few skirts, a few shirts. I'm just going to put something on. There's not a lot of choice. Um, also, the shame about certain parts of my body, like, oh, my legs aren't good enough, or my knees aren't good enough, or whatever. It didn't matter anymore because they were covered. And the only person who saw them was my husband, and he loved me anyway. Um, and that was also really freeing. Instead of the whistles on the street that I used to get and the comments, I, find, I found men like calling me ma'am, even though I wasn't very old, and opening doors for me and showing me respect, which is very different. I haven't arrived at perfection in these areas at all. Um, I think God is still teaching me what's modest, and I can still desire excessive and expensive clothes. I still need to be reminded that God made me in a good way and that the beauty standards of the world are Satan's lies, that he delights in insecurity and self-loathing, but God made us all good. So I can honestly say now that I'm really grateful for God's ways. I'm grateful for the head covering and modesty and simplicity because they free me and all of my sisters from a world of heartache. Thank you, Laura. You can go ahead. So I grew up in a community where both modesty and head covering were not unfamiliar concepts to me. Um, modesty was some vague idea <clears throat> that would possibly apply to me when I was married, uh, a church member. Uh, I'd probably wear a skirt, maybe wear a head covering. Um, there wasn't, in, a, in the Russian Mennonite culture I'm from, there's, 
there's a large spectrum of application right within the same congregation. So there were those in my church that wore very traditional, plain, homemade clothes. And there were those that wore jeans and shorts and tank tops during the week and threw on a skirt for church on Sunday. So um, my family was closer to the latter. And yeah, within the influence of public school and the group of people that we generally associated with, um, modesty didn't really apply to children, maybe just in slight ways. For example, um, tank tops and shorts were reserved for like camping trips and beaches and less public areas. To school, you know, we wore jeans or, you know, something with sleeves. Um, Modesty and what it looks like and why it's practiced was not something that was commonly talked about at all. Uh, the pre impression I got as a child and then also as a young woman was that it's, it's more of a separation from the world issue and not a lust issue or a glorifying God issue. All these things were not talked about at all. Um, and head covering was considered a symbol of marriage and there wasn't any deeper understanding of it. So when I surrendered my life to Christ at the age of 18, clothing was only one of the many things that very dramatically changed in my life. <clears throat> I remember looking in my closet as a brand new believer wondering, now what does a Christian wear? I pulled out my most modest clothes and they were my church clothes um, in stark contrast to my regular clothes. Um, I hadn't had any thorough teaching on it and obviously, I hadn't studied clothing from a biblical perspective. So what was sure is that it was my intention to not do with my clothing what I had always done with my clothing. I had always dressed in pride. I had dressed to turn heads, to cause men to lust. And all, all of this was very purposeful. I did it on purpose. And I didn't want any part of that now. And so this was my starting point in modesty. Um, I got a t job teaching at a private school, and there was a requirement that you would wear a dress. So I started to sew my own dresses. And looking back now, I can be a little embarrassed at the dresses that I wore. I mean, they were really screaming tight dresses. But in my mind, I was wearing a dress, and it had sleeves. And so, like, surely I was modest. Um, there was this unspoken social norm or line set for baptized church members in the community that, you know, if you're wearing a dress or a skirt and top, you're modest. If you're wearing pants, you're not. That's just pretty much the line, and I didn't think any further than that. One day, a very dear friend of mine, she was a co-teacher and a sister in Christ, she told me, you know, Becky, if I was wearing that, I would just wear a sweater. She was so sweet, and I looked, and it was very true. I needed to wear a sweater. I really, honestly, never thought about it, but I did. I, I started to wear a sweater, for one, and I modified my clothing. Um, it was around this time that I came across um, 1 Corinthians 11 and read it for what it said. And I realized that it applied to me. Head covering in my culture was reserved for married women only. And it was somehow connected to a sexual relationship. So a single woman putting on a head covering was a very suspicious thing. So it was a difficult thing to do because I knew what would be said. But I also felt very strongly that that's what it was telling me to do, so I did it. About three years later, I joined a conservative Mennonite church. And although I didn't necessarily understand all the detailed rules and regulations of dress, I was taught some very valuable things about modesty in this setting. Um, things like loose-fitting skirts being as important as any looseness around the breasts. There was a very kind minister and his wife that you know, while they affirmed my heart after Christ, they warned me that my behavior towards young men wasn't necessarily very modest at all times. And this was a difficult thing to hear. I mean, they told me, they told me that my behavior would attract young men that didn't run very deep spiritually. And you know, they were right. I'm sure it was very hard for them to tell me that. I mean, who wants to say that to anybody, right? But I'm so thankful now that somebody was willing to put themselves kind of in a really awkward place and correct me in this area of my life. So now I was wearing a cape dress and 
I was feeling really radical, definitely modest. But here, um, pride crept in, and I felt like as long as I was in a cape dress, that sufficed. Like I had no desire to incite lust, but I did dress for my friends. The, the accessories had to be just right. Um, I wanted to be thought cute, chic, if you will. Um, you know, it's a really hard thing to admit to yourself that the reason you chose the clothing for the day was was because you wanted to be well thought of or admired or turn heads in some way. It was hard to admit that if I had lost 10 pounds, I chose the dress that would show it. Or that if I kept some baby weight, that was super embarrassing. Um, in the same way that I had stayed comfortably stayed within the social norms um, and not brought to the Lord and asked him what he thinks of clothing right at the beginning of my Christian walk, here again I had fallen into that exact same ditch. While staying within church standards, self and pride were really present. This had become such a pattern in my life. There, was, there were lines set up, and sometimes the lines were set up by myself, sometimes by a church or the community. And feeling comfortable within those lines, I didn't allow God to dictate what, to me what was modest. I didn't ask him, and neither was my conscience sensitive to what God was saying about my dress or else my pride. So I had to learn to guard against this pattern. I had to learn to ask God to direct me as I chose clothes. I had to learn to be just brutally honest with myself and stand in front of a mirror and ask, why did I, why did I choose these clothes today? Like, Am I trying to glorify God? Am I trying to draw attention to myself? Keep a little bit of that glory to myself? What is my motiv motivation for what I buy, what I choose to wear? I feel a little nervous sharing all of this because I don't want to come across, same as Laura, um, as thinking as, as if I've arrived. I don't feel like I've arrived at all. I'm still learning to daily surrender all of that pride um, my insecurities or my choices to God. You know, he designed beautiful uh, womanhood and he doesn't need us to adorn it. It's, it's beaut beautiful as it is. Um, although I realize that Paul was specifically writing about a situation involving sexual immorality, I think it also applies to modesty, so I'm going to end with this. 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20 say, Or do you, not, do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you? whom you have from God, and you are not your own? For you were brought, bought at a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. And that's my intention. That's the area that I want to grow in. I just want to glorify God in what I wear and also in my spirit. See if this is on here. Um, when we were preparing, Alyssa was trying to do Word docs and all these fancy things, and she said, "Hey guys, I'm not Clark," and I just like to say, "I'm not Matthew here." So, um, yeah, I'm pretty nervous about this, but you all look very friendly, so that's helpful. Um, so I'm going to talk about my new identity in Christ in regards to uh, appearance. Um, I, I didn't grow up with a lot of fashion. I didn't really care about fashion. Having a single mom and living in poverty, um, it just, it was so far out of my mind. Um, at 13, like most 13 year olds, I started seeking self and identity probably for the first time and considering what I should wear and who I should be. At that time, I started to live in rebellion, started drinking, started having boyfriends, doing drugs, um, a lot of self-abuse. Um, I, I met skinheads for the first time, and by the, I started running away at that time. By my 15th birthday, I lived with them full time, and um, fashion and identity meant something for the first time. Everything meant something. The color of your boot laces, everything, every detail. Um, the first time I met them, the first time I lived with them, they shaved my head bald, and I became a skinhead that day. And so, with a bald head, for girls, what they do is they grow out the outer edge of their hair, and that symbolizes um, pride and honor because it means you know you got in the right way. You were initiated. It was shaved. It's growing. 
and how long your fringe is um, shows how long you've been a skinhead. So it's very, very respected. Um, after two and a half years, I married my skinhead boyfriend. Um, several months later, in a desperate plea to God, I started to accept his love for me for the first time. And I stepped out in faith to know him. Um, through that, that led me through repentance, through trying to learn who Christ was, and then baptism. Initially, I gave up everything that was bad, everything that I knew um, that was wrong, fornication, drunkenness, drugs, violence, fighting. Um, and God gave me the desires of my heart. And for the first time, like, in years, I wanted long hair. I wanted it so desperately. And so I started growing it. It was a couple inches long. Um, and it occurred to me one time that I can't keep this part of my sin. I can't keep this fringe on this outer, this long hair. I can't keep this pride and this, you know, honor and sin. Um, I was confused at first because it's the thing I wanted most was this long hair. And that was my first lesson in sacrifice, that God gives us good things that he requires us to yield to him. You know, you see that with yielding father, mother, all sorts of good things. Um, and so I, I cut off my fringe and I threw it away. Um, and I just set my heart to normalize. What does it like, um, when you sister shared, like, what do I wear? What does a Christian wear? And so I started learning, how do I do my makeup? How do I do my hair? What, what shoes do I put on? What clothes do I wear? And so I just started following what I saw around me, and I felt normal for the first time um, since I was a small child. Um, but I learned God didn't want me to be conformed to this world. He wanted me to be transformed. And so he didn't leave me at normal. Um, and these verses on long hair that I came to appreciate now seem to be saying to cover it up. And here's another lesson on sacrifice. Um, it, it maybe wasn't so hard to put it on right at first, but the thought hit me, I have to do this forever. I've never, like, I've never seen this. How is this going to be? Um, the hardest temptation for me in stumbling block to the head covering was the fact that now I was going to a church and none of the other ladies did it. I've never heard of the head covering. I've never seen anybody that did it. Um, I was uneducated. I didn't have a Bible background. And who was I to say I know more than the rest of Christianity? Like, I, I'm, by putting this on, I'm, I'm saying that I'm proud. Um, Eventually, through faith, I just decided, well, God says it. I'm just going to have to do it. Um, I felt like I, I was learning a big lesson, that a couple things. One, I thought it would hurt my testimony with my family. And I, I think it, I, I know, I know it did. Um, it, it wasn't a good situation. I learned a couple things that Satan will tempt us to believe, like Peter, that we have to protect Jesus when all Jesus wants us to do is walk in faith, um, that we have to protect his testimony. Um, and also that he'll use our humility to keep us incapacitated for the kingdom. Um, so I just decided to walk in faith. And, and like Laura, I started having this experience, yes, ma'am, can I get the door for you, ma'am? Um, it was a very strange feeling. Um, I started looking into jewelry and adornment. Uh, and so I, as I gave that up, I initially kept my wedding ring. Like, surely God doesn't want me to communicate that I'm not married. You know, that's, um, and again, God doesn't want me to protect him. He wants me to walk in faith. I came across makeup, and the preacher said from the pulpit, we're not against makeup. If the barn needs painting, paint it. <laughs> and, uh, I thought, that doesn't seem like the spirit of God when, <laughs> when, uh, when he created man and woman, and he said, it is good. And so I thought, well, you know, I don't think I want to paint the barn. Um, <laughs> and I started looking into, why do we? Why do we? If God says it is good, why are we putting on lipstick and blush? And when I started looking into why these things are done, like, those things mimic fertility and the hormone flush saying you're fertile and you're ovulating. And I thought, do I want to communicate to the world that I'm ovulating? Um, 
big eyes, um, sh sh uh, not shaved, plucked eyebrows, like you're communicating you're young. Um, so young and fertile weren't things that I wanted to, my face to be saying. Um, the other reason I heard was, oh, it's only for myself. I just want to feel beautiful for myself. And I thought, well, would I do it if I was on an island alone? Probably not. So, th so I can't claim that I'm doing that for myself. Also, uh, recently I had, um, when I first got converted, I removed all of my body piercings that people could see. I kept all of the ones that nobody could see. And I thought, well, wearing makeup just for myself is contrary to what God had just led me through when I thought, you know what, I'm going to get rid of all of these other ones that are, you know, just for me. The last reason people told me why it was okay to wear makeup um, was that it's to just hide flaws and blemishes. Um, thinking about that it is good, I thought about the imperfections that are normal and that everybody have has. Um, I thought about it felt like we're keeping each other in bondage and to an unrealistic beauty standard that we're living, Instagram wasn't a thing then, but that we're living a, a real life Instagram filter. Um, it's one of the, it's probably the strongest and most passionate reason I am against makeup is what we're doing to our sisters um, by raising the bar and raising this beauty standard that God didn't make. Um, there's this quote from C.S. Lewis that says, pride gets no pleasure out of having something, only out of having more of it than the next man. We say that people are proud of being rich or clever or good looking, but they are not. They are proud of being richer or clever or better looking than others. If everyone else became equally rich or clever or good looking, there would be nothing to be proud about. It is the comparison that makes you proud, the pleasure of being above the rest. Once the element of competition has gone, pride has gone. So, um, when I got converted, I had a priest come to my house, actually, to do an exorcism. And he was uh, spreading his holy water and chanting around the house and burning all the paraphernalia that I had left. Um, and he said, when we get rid of these things in your life, your, your heart and your life are going to have this hole in it. And you need to fill that up with something. You need to choose what you fill that up with. I chose that, that, that Jesus would fill that hole in my life. And I just poured into the scriptures and pushed into his love that I had felt. So here I was with no makeup and no jewelry, and I'm wearing a head covering, and I'm wearing skirts, and I really just pressed into my femininity and, like, how do I dress? Like, okay, I want to be a woman for the first time. Um, and now here I was again, and I had this new hole and this new empty space in my life. What do I replace all of this with? I lost my skinhead identity. I lost my family identity. And now I was losing my new, like, Baptist mom identity, my American identity. Um, so again, I chose Christ. Um, and I originally planned to stop my testimony here and talk about what Christ-likeness was and, and the scriptures um, surrounding how to dress, uh, why we dress the way we are. There are answers for why we do the things we do. Um, I've shared a few of them. The other sisters will share more. We have great teachings, the head covering teaching on our website. Um, but I decided I'm going to go on with my testimony. Um, and I decided not to go over more of the whys and uh, talk about the hows. As a true homeschool mom, I know we need to learn how to find the answers for ourselves, not just be told what they are. So originally, I thought the Bible was just a rule book. I didn't know the difference between that and a book of law, attorneys quoting numbers, and, and it seemed like Christians did the same. Like, it's just a very long list of rules, and it's impossible to know them all, but if you don't obey them, you know, you'll pay for it, or else. Um, and, and in Christianity hearing, you know, you'll go to hell if you don't do all of these things, and it, it seemed like a big motivator. Um, to know these laws and do it. 
the or else version of Christianity didn't feel consistent with walking in the likeness of his resurrection. It felt like a stumbling block to approaching the scriptures with a pure heart if our only desire is, will I go to hell or not? Um, as I began reading the scripture and pouring into the scripture, I realized it wasn't a book of rules, but it was a living word. And it was for every time and every person and every place. Um, I thought so much more than any, any situation we could think of. It taught how to abide in Christ, how to receive grace and mercy, how to see and know God, how to forsake our own understandings, how to walk in the newness of life, how to offer ourselves a living sacrifice, how to have our minds governed by the Spirit. Um, the Word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. We need to allow God's word and his principle to judge our heart, to be willing to lay down our own deceits, our, our hearts, and give him ultimately authority, ultimate authority to rule our thoughts and our practices. So I put together a list of questions that I learned to ask myself. Um, and I still ask them um, and learn, learn how in all the whys. Um, I'm sure you could customize this list, but here's some. The first one and the foundation to Christianity, if God says it, will I do it no matter what? And if we can't answer yes to that, I'm not sure the hows or whys uh, matter very much. Um, so often I hear people, even in our circles, saying, yeah, the Bible says that, but I'll lose my family or my church. Um, I, I, I do believe the Bible says that, but I just can't pay the price. And that, that can't be in Christianity. Um, have I been buried with him in baptism? Am I walking in the newness of life? What are my cultural biases in understanding this principle? Am I conformed to the world? Do I look to it for my beauty standards? Are my influences in conflict with God's principles? What are the origins of the thing I'm doing? Does this benefit my flesh? Am I violating any of God's principles? Am I being loving to other women? Am I putting my desire to please man above giving God's word an honest ear? How has the church understood a practice or doctrine for thousands of years? Did Christianity only recently get rid of this particular practice? Am I wanting to know what I'll go to hell for just so I can walk up to that line? How is this principle applied across cultures? Do I find myself often asking, why can't I? Do, my, do I tell myself the Bible doesn't say I can't to excuse things I want to do? And the very best question I have ever learned to ask myself instead of why can't I is why do I want to? Wow, those are great, guys. I kind of just want to listen. <laughs> I don't know if I want to. Like, I'm like learning little tidbits about you guys I actually didn't know. This is really good. Um, thank you all so much for coming. It's, I feel like we have a great crowd. <laughs> um, many of you are in your 20s. When I was in my mid-20s, that's where I'm going to start my story tonight was when I was in my mid-20s and my firstborn Ava was just a little baby. I had the opportunity to volunteer for one of the country's largest theatrical church productions. It was a pageant that follows the story of Jesus from birth to resurrection and this thing was big. Like they had live camels. I mean, it was like huge. And my friend and I tried out and we were cast as angels in this production. Um, be, I, I don't know why, but you know, we had the big hair, we had glitter, lots of makeup, and um, we were angels. And <laughs> um, every night for weeks, 
as I was, I was harnessed up, there, a special team came out that works for um, singers that put on big shows. So the special team came out, um, the safety team, because we were harnessed up in a harness. And um, <laughs> we were above the ceiling, like 80 feet in the air. Okay, and the ceiling would open up every night and we would come out of the roof, like out of the ceiling, and we would just hang there at Jesus's birth and then again at his resurrection. And it was a lot of fun. Um, but every night for weeks, as I, was, as I was up there, I would hear these words from Luke chapter one. And the angel said to her, do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give to him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. In his kingdom there will be no end. And every night when I was up there under the black lights, um, <laughs> I was like, wow, Mary found favor with God. Why did God choose Mary? What was it about her? Uh, why was she the favored one? Have you guys ever thought about that? Like, why Mary? And yeah, every night that verse just stuck with me. Do not be afraid. You have found favor with God. Blessed was she among women. And I wanted to find favor with God. That just set me on a path um, where I wanted to be pleased by my father. I wanted him to see me and say, that's my daughter. That's my favored one. And it's a pure love um, that a daughter has for her father. And the desires of my heart totally shifted. It was actually during that time that my husband and I really begun uh, studying the words of Christ and um, wrestling with our faith. We became intolerant of the complacency in our lives. I grew up believing in God, going to church, without really having any clue what he was like. I spent a large chunk of my teenage life feeling guilty and distant from God from a lot of the choices that I was making. And my view of God was narrow and small. It was not until I started understanding the two kingdoms that everything clicked for me. You are the salt of the earth. Salt does not just make food taste good. It's a preserving agent. Preserving food with salt is an ancient human practice. And as Christians, we're the salt of the earth. It draws water out of food and dehydrates it so bacteria can't grow. High salt levels are toxic to microbes. Many microbes will rupture due to the difference in pressure between the outside and the inside of an organism. Like, this is us as Christians. This is who we're supposed to be. And the, sh the church should have a redemptive impact on the world. We are salt. We can't forget that. Um, we're a unique people. We're supposed to look different than the world. That's who we are. And that's because we're continually being transformed by the word and the spirit of God. And one of those ways of transformation, for me, there was many ways. But we're here tonight to talk about modesty. So that is, that's one of the ways he transformed me. I laid everything down at his feet. As I started understanding my citizenship as a daughter of the king, major things started changing in my heart. That paired with a lot of early church commentary and really hungering and thirsting for righteousness for the first time in my life, things started to really radically change. I started searching the scriptures for truth, and I found it. This journey of transformation in my heart, mind, and appearance has been incredible, but it did cost me. It cost me nothing short of everything. 
Bonhoeffer said, when Christ calls a man, he bids him come and die. Death is not easy. Death and cost paying are essential parts of discipleship. The truth about modesty and head covering started being revealed to me. And it's so much more than the clothes we wear. It's about the body and the heart of Christ we are re representing. We are representing Christ. I invested so much time and money into my appearance, getting my hair done, colored, cut, all the makeup that I would buy, clothes, shoes. I was painting the barn and I was enjoying it. I loved makeup, I did. I thought it was fun. Like for me, it wasn't like this burden. I really had a lot of fun. I enjoyed it. I liked having nice hair. I liked looking cute. Um, well, what I then thought was cute. My nails, nail polish, it was all just fun girl stuff. Um, so when all this was going on, I was sitting in church on Sunday morning, and I'm like, why am I taking all of this time to bring glory to myself? Because ultimately, that's what I was doing. Isaiah 6 really just rocked my world. I'm going to read Isaiah 6 for you guys. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, high and lifted up. And the train of his robe filled the temple. Above it stood seraphim. Each one had six wings. With two, he covered his face. With two, he covered his feet. And with two, he flew. And one cried to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. Who am I? Who am I? The God of the universe who created these majestic seraphim with all these wings. And I mean, like, can you imagine? They're in the throne room of God and they are covering themselves because his glory is so great. Who am I? Like the God of the universe who created our galaxy with over a hundred billion stars and he has named every single one of them. He created snowflakes and flowers and laughter. All of these things and I'm trying to seek attention for myself, why? <laughs> um, it was pride, pride of life. And it's something that we have to fight. I still have to fight it. But he loves us. And I realized I was not really loving him or others. I was just creating unnecessary stumbling blocks for them. Here's a quote from Elizabeth Elliot. Think of the self that God has given as an acorn. It is a marvelous little thing, a perfect shape perfectly designed for its purpose, perfectly functional. Think of the grand glory of an oak tree. God's intention when he made the acorn was the oak tree. His intention for us is the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Let me say that again. The measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Many deaths must go into our reaching that measure. Many letting goes. When you look at the oak tree, you don't feel that the loss of the acorn is a very great loss. The more you perceive God's purpose in your life, the less terrible the losses seem. I told you this journey cost me everything. Reputation, pleasure, friends, even at one point my family. I've been told to take that rag off your head. I've been told you're taking this Christianity thing way too far. I've been called self-righteous. I've been called radical. 
people have told me I've lost my mind, that I don't look as nice as I used to look. I'm not stylish enough, not pretty enough. And I have moments when I'm tired, like I'm tired. I get tired of fighting, tired of standing out in a crowd. I have to fight my flesh even today where I wanna wake up and just be like a normal person. (laughs) Can I just be normal? Do I have to stand out? Um, But when you look at the oak tree, you don't feel that loss of the acorn. It's not a really great loss. So I carry on, so we carry on. And many deaths of self continue to go into reaching that measure. So I'm here tonight to encourage all of you to keep going. Amen. Thank you, sisters, very much for sharing your testimonies. It is so inspiring to see just vastly different backgrounds come together on common ground um, when we think about modesty. We're going to move on to the questions that you guys have submitted. Thank you for submitting questions. We really appreciate the participation in, um, in submitting those questions, and we really appreciate it. I will let you know there's a couple of questions that have been slightly modified. We either broke them up into two questions. That was mostly, I think we broke some up into multiple questions and then there were some that were somewhat similar so we combined them. So I hope we still got to the heart of the questions that you um, submitted. Um, And so we have about 10 questions here. And then once we are done with the questions portions, I'm gonna actually open it up to you guys if you have any clarifying questions regarding their testimonies or um, how they've answered these questions, uh, maybe 10 minutes or so, we'll, we'll open it up to you guys. All right, you guys ready? <laughs> All right, so we are going to, um, I'm going to ask Natasha to take this first question. I will read the question and then when I'm done, you can just go ahead and go right in. All right, many women from conservative Anabaptist communities feel that a heavy emphasis on modesty, specifically for women, is an attack on beauty. Is beauty the enemy? Or is there room for beauty in clothing? Is it wrong to dress attractively? Should beauty inform the way we dress? Or does beauty in dress detract from humility? All right. Oh. All right. Well, those are really great questions. I think it's important, first and foremost, when we're talking about beauty in our bodies, to understand that we need to lay our foundation in creation. The story of creation, which is in Genesis 1 through 3, identifies God as our creator. We were made in his image, according to his likeness, male and female, he created us. Then God saw everything that he made, and indeed, it was very good. So the word good in Genesis chapter 1 is actually the same Hebrew word that is also translated as beautiful in other parts of the Old Testament. In the beginning, nakedness was not shameful. He created us to be naked and not ashamed. So as I was studying for this discussion, I came across a really interesting quote in regards to this. And forgive me for not knowing the source. Um, I couldn't find it, but, but here's the quote. Why were they not ashamed? Because they were not aware of the fact they were naked. After they ate of the forbidden fruit, Adam and Eve's eyes were opened, and they were made aware of their condition. They sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons, or as the New King James Version says, coverings. This word means a girdle or a loincloth. One version states they covered themselves around the hips. What is very interesting is that the clothing they made was apparently not according to God's standards. Also for Adam and his wife, the Lord God made tunics of skin and clothed them. This word for tunic means a long shirt-like garment. Strong's Concordance even gives the definition as a robe. It was a garment that began at the shoulders and flowed down like a long shirt. Adam and Eve had made themselves loin coverings, 
but the Lord made them robes and clothed them. The implication seems to be that they were not sufficiently covered by the fig leaves alone. Notice also when God came into the garden, Adam said, I was naked and hid myself. He had on fig leaves, but he still refers to himself as being naked. And God did not argue with him. God simply replied with, who told you you were naked? So beauty is not presented as the enemy of modesty here, but rather it is given as a gift to conceal human beauty in their new condition, fallen yet affectionately cared for. We know what happens later on in this story of creation to new creation. We know that the savior of the world comes and redeems every aspect of creation, including you and me. And now we are the temple of the Holy Spirit of God. We are a royal priesthood, which is incredible and very beautiful. True beauty begins at the cross when we learn to love. Love is the foundation for all of this. We cover our bodies not out of guilt on anymore or shame because we think our bodies are bad. We cover out of love for God first and foremost and out of love for our neighbor. Through all of this, modesty is still a gift to God's covenant people. So now that we laid that foundation, everyone does have their own perception of beauty. And we all have our own aesthetic preferences. Depending on where you come from in the world, Culturally, beauty is very ambiguous. The idea of beauty is always shifting. Considering we all come from such different walks of life and experiences, I would say there is room to have aesthetic differences in our clothing while still being modest. Beauty is simply a combination of qualities, such as shape, color, or form that pleases the aesthetic senses. And as Christians, God's aesthetic senses matter the most. He is very clear on what he finds value in. 1 Peter 3, But let your adorning be the hidden person of the heart, with the imperishable beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which in God's sight is very precious. Isaiah 52, How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him who brings good news, who publishes peace, who brings good news of happiness, who publishes salvation, who says to Zion, your God reigns. Of course, we have the full chapter of Proverbs 31, and not to mention Song of Songs, which appears to be about love and sexual longing between a man and a woman, but some read it as an allegory of Christ and his bride. You are altogether beautiful, my darling. There is no flaw in you. That Song of Songs 4-7. So the culture around us does not get to dictate what we find value in as a people. I think about this stuff very often because I'm a mama. I'm a mama of 10, and seven of those children are girls. So four of those girls are from East Africa. And God has uniquely designed each and every one of them very different. All of my girls look very different and unique and special. In the world that my African daughters grew up in, many women were lightening their skin, chemically straightening their hair, and finding value in looking more European. My desire is for my girls to embrace their kinky hair, dark skin, and body shape. They are beautiful. Interesting enough, I recently read a study by Massachusetts General Hospital and Wellesley College. The researchers had 35,000 volunteers, including 547 pairs of identical twins and 214 pairs of fraternal twins. They completed a facial preference study and found that individual views of attracted, attractiveness are largely unique to each person. The inclusion of identical twins was key to the study's findings, as it proved that even people with the same genes don't always agree on what they find attractive. That suggests that physical preferences are based mainly on experiences and what we may see in social or popular media, rather than on a natural or genetic preference for certain traits. 
So this study shows us once again that physical preferences are largely based on experiences, and I would even say on our values. But if our enjoyment of beauty ends only in ourselves, in vanity or self-centeredness, it does not really reveal who we are as image bearers of God. The way we dress definitely aids in humility. So let's be Christian women who dress with intent and purpose, prayerfully laying before God our wardrobe and asking him to give us wisdom because he will. With all that being said, I don't see beauty as the enemy. Uh, Being ugly or dressing ugly is not the goal. We should be respectable and take care of ourselves and ultimately living for the king in his glory. Thank you, Natasha. Um, The second question is going to go to Laura. Why doesn't the Bible clearly outline what is modest and what isn't? Is it clear from the Bible that modesty is just something subjective that depends on culture and a person's intentions? Okay, I think that it's true that the Bible does not lay out specific definitions of modesty, but I think there is something beyond just the subjective or the cultural that we can find. So I would say first, in general, I think the Bible tends to be a book of principles. When you think about wealth, God calls us to not store up treasure in heaven. He says, be generous. He doesn't give us a percentage of our income that would say, if you give this much, you qualify as generous. He doesn't say, this is the dollar amount before you're storing up treasures on earth. And so I think in a lot of areas, God gives us principles, and he wants us to think and wrestle And when we make our own applications, it reveals our hearts. So I think this modesty is one of these areas. And at the same time, I do think that there are three streams that we can find in the world that will help us give a helpful sense of what is modest. So the first one I would say is just, um, Paul refers to it as nature itself in 1 Corinthians 11, or just common sense, that we know that if we're trying to be modest, like the explicitly sexual parts of the body, like the chest, is something that we should cover. Paul puts it this way in 1 Corinthians, our presentable parts are treated with greater modesty, which our more presentable parts do not require. So that's the first stream. I think there's three streams that can converge to give us this sense of modest. So the second one is history. I spent a lot of time over the last few weeks going through illustrated histories of clothing. And I'll show you some pictures in just a second. Um, I think there's a general consensus among ancient and traditional societies of what people wear, what women wear, and what is modest. So women tend to wear skirts and dresses, sometimes with pants under the skirt, as in China or India. When the clothing is a robe for both men and women, usually women's robes are longer. Chests are always covered, legs are always covered, and the shape of the body is not accented. And often um, the woman's head is covered too and her hair. So I'll show you some pictures. Hopefully this works. Let's see. Okay. Sorry, somehow I got to the end at the beginning. So we'll go back. Okay. So the first one, this is a reconstruction of prehistoric clothing. This is from um, the areas of like the far north of Europe now. This is Sumerian clothing from the ancient Near East. You can see the um, shawl going across the body. This is a Peloponnesian woman. You can see for the, the head covered here. Hellenistic period, also Greece. She also has her head covered. This is the Empress Theodora in the middle, who was the Empress of the, of the Byzantine Empire in the sixth century. Um, this is actually, yeah, so this uh, mosaic is from the sixth century. On the right, you have the Countess Matilda. Again, we've, we've gone forward pretty far here. Now we're in the 12th century AD. And yet, there's still a very loose, long garment with a head covering. This is later in the medieval period. The woman is on the right. And now, we'll move into traditional societies. So I'm defining a traditional society as one where 
the clothing didn't change a lot over the centuries, as in Western Europe, it started to change. Century, um, cultures like Japan, China, and India changed less. So here's Japan, the 19th century, Manchu in China, and this is the Indian salwar kameez, which is actually still worn today. Um, again, the head's covered, a long tunic. So this is not to say that there was no immodesty in these early ancient or traditional cultures, there was. And Tertullian and Clement of Alexandria both wrote against the immodesty of their day. Um, Clement wrote about women wearing sheer garments, particularly. But I think we can learn from Paul, he says that men will go from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. And I think the history of clothing and fashion is that kind of downward trend that Paul is talking about. And um, so I think we can say that we can get a picture of modesty from these more ancient cultures to kind of put a pin in and get an idea of what might be modest. And now I'm going to show you a little bit of the step downward that Western Europe took. So it's very interesting to me. Um, I read this week a lot of this book, 20,000 Years of Fashion by Francois Boucher. It, he, this is a totally secular book. And he wrote, the great innovation in Europe after the mid 14th century is the abandonment of the long flowing costume common to both sexes. So basically until that time, he's saying, everybody's pretty much wearing a long flowing garment. So at this point, the fashion designer first appears in the form of artist starting to design clothes. And there were two innovations right around this time, like 1350 or so, that met with scandalized opposition in society. The first one for men is the short coat. So men go from wearing a long robe to wearing a coat that stops at their waist or their hips. This is like Shakespeare's time. Um, they wear hose with it. And um, the part over the genitalia is called a codpiece. Um, obviously drawing attention there rather than covering. And then for women, the necklines plunged at the same time. And all of a sudden, for the first time in mainstream clothing, women are really showing a lot of chest. These pictures are really representative. I could have chosen dozens like this. So this is not like cherry picking. This is pretty representative for this time. Um, the one caveat that I would give is that we don't have a lot of depictions of peasants or normal people from the early times just because they couldn't afford to be depicted. Um, so honestly, I think since the emergence of this moment of kind of fashion and this downward step in Europe, being immodest has been in pretty much for the rest of history. Um, there's a few exceptions, Puritan England, Puritan America, Victorian England. There are moments where modesty is again the mainstream thing and maybe even moments of overreaction. But generally, I think um, we've entered from that point on going from bad to worse in immodesty. Interestingly, there are still other faiths that value modesty. My family went to Israel this summer, and it was fascinating that literally every day, if not multiple times a day, I was mistaken for an Orthodox Jew. Because of my head covering and my clothes, I had no idea that the dress was that similar. Um, but it, it was really astounding. I kept getting like pushed to the front of lines. I wouldn't have to be searched for like weapons when we went into sensitive parts, like into the um, temple compound, because they just assumed I was an Orthodox Jew. It was very interesting. And in the same way, I think moderate Muslims have landed in a similar place to where we are. Obviously not the extreme of the burqa or something like that, or a face veil. But moderate Muslims also wear a long skirt, a long dress. It's not tight. They wear a head covering. So I think this stream of history, again, gives us a picture and of these other faiths of a general idea of what modesty is. The, f the final and most important stream that helps us get this definition of modesty is the Bible. It's true that the Bible doesn't give a lot of explicit commands. This is modest, this isn't. But I think there are glimpses into God's viewpoint of what he finds modest and what he finds shameful. So in Isaiah 47, God describes the judgment of Babylon and he compares Babylon to a woman. And her judgment is to be shamed. And he says, put off your veil, strip off your robe, uncover your legs. And it's, it's really fascinating to me that these are very similar. If the positive of these, covering the legs, 
covering your head. These are what we're seeing in these um, ancient societies of what was covered. 1 Corinthians 11.10, Paul speaks of covering our heads and probably the hair as well that's on the head. And Tertullian wrote of this as potentially referring to evil angels who are attracted to the women's head and to the hair of her uncovered head. And so it, we get this glimpse that somehow God seems to see a woman's uncovered hair in public as immodest, which is surprising, I think, to our culture, but um, it agrees with these pictures from history that we've seen. Finally, in Revelation 1.13, Jesus appears in the midst of the lampstands, and it says he's wearing a garment down to his feet. I don't think that this is a direct command to wear garments down to our feet, but it is suggestive of what is holy and set apart to God. If you're still not sure, I think a good hint if you're trying to decide a definition of modesty is to look at what the world accentuates and shows off when people want to be alluring and do the opposite. It really leads you to the same conclusions that I think we've found so far. Thank you, Laura. Um, I'm gonna open it up for questions one and two if anyone else has anything to add to that. Not? Okay. We're going to go to question number three. Um, this question is two different questions combined. Um, for Erica, how have you balanced living a modest life in a way that helps minimize the temptation for our brothers in Christ without living in fear of causing men to stumble? How do you balance the fact that lust is an issue of the heart while also recognizing that we should be doing our best to avoid causing temptation. Should we be relating the two? Recently, there was an article about modesty on an Anabaptist platform that advocated complete, completely separating any discussion on modesty from a discussion about lust. In essence, don't teach women to be modest because it may be a protection for their brother for their brothers in the battle against lust. One reason for this, they said, was that the Bible never lumps these two together. Another was that sexual abuse is rampant even among Muslim communities. Do you have any thoughts on this? Yeah, so as far as the lust issue um, with our brothers and how do we live a life not in fear, I think some of it goes to back back to what Natasha is saying about we don't need to live in shame. I mean, God made our female bodies and we don't need to be ashamed of them. Um, we can recognize that God made us beautiful, part of his beautiful creation. But we should also be careful to not add to them to attract or to entice men. Um, I, I came across the, no, like the idea of sex appeal as I was studying modesty and I think it's something we don't talk about much. And I think often when planar circles use the word modesty, what they're really trying to get at is sex appeal. Um, so I kind of separated this more into three parts. The second, um, should we be relating the two? Recently, there was an article about modesty on an Anabaptist platform suggesting that we separate the topics. Um, I think conservative Anabaptists are in a little bit of a unique spot for this discussion, primarily because they're, when we're talking about these isolated, very conservative groups, there's a lot of reaction against some, I don't know how to say it, some pretty bad authors writing some pretty bad things. Um, I, I've read some of it recently, down to what color underwear you should wear, and I'm not sure what else, but they're in a very controlled and isolated environment that we're just not in. The women make clothing um, with no sex appeal. And so the environment's very controlled. Um, and so yeah, in, in that environment, we absolutely should not be talking about women need to be modest to prevent men's lust because they're clearly lusting in those environments and that's clearly not the problem. But in scripture, when it warns about the harlot, it does, it does talk about her wearing clothes of a harlot, but it also talks about other things like enticing. It says her heart is subtle. She flatters and draws men in with her eyes. 
Um, in general, the warning is not to be tempted by a woman, however she tempts. In our culture, we live in a, in a very sex-craved, sex-driven culture. And so I think, it, I think it's apparent that that's how women tempt in our culture. Um, they do tempt with immodesty. And so while the scripture doesn't maybe say, don't be immodest because it'll make men to lust, maybe it doesn't say those words. It does say that we should warn our sons about the tempting woman. Um, and in our, in our sex-charged culture, like I said, the tempting women, woman is often through immodesty. I read a study today that says sex, often immodesty, in advertising sells by grabbing attention for two main reasons. It's evoking an emotional response like lust, arousal, and desire. And two, it's improving recall of advertising messages. In addition to advertising, studies say that 73 to 93% of boys have viewed pornography by 18, with the average age being 11 years old. It would be an injustice as mothers to separate lust from immodesty while raising our sons in an immodest and sex-charged culture that's trying to evoke their lust, arousal, and desire. The reason these conversations are important is we need to warn them and teach them that their environment won't be controlled for them. We're not raising our sons in a controlled environment where women are attempting to not draw them in. And we need to tell them, here is how temptation looks in our culture today. And it is 100% on you to not sin. For our daughters, outside of an isolated culture and homemade clothing or burkas, we need to teach them that sex appeal is built into the things we put on. It's built into the high, sho high heel shoes, the makeup, the push-up bras, the smooth exposed legs, all sorts of things in the ways we look and the things we buy. We need to ask them if they're dressing for sex appeal, whether that's by their own intentions or by the manufacturers who made the things that we're putting on. We have to interact with the world's intentions and not just assume that we aren't caught up in them or being used for their purposes. Um, part three to the question, um, it, it's mentioning sex abuse is rampant even in Muslim communities. Any thoughts on this? So as for sexual abuse happening in modest cultures, I was recently crushed to see a recent Anabaptist exhibit showing the clothes little girls and women were wearing when they were assaulted. Nothing the girl wearing a toddler dress, bloomers, or bonnet could have done to, pre to protect herself from abuse. And there's nothing these women can do to protect themselves from abuse. Modesty should never be a part of the conversation about abuse. And a woman tempting a man in every way is still not responsible for being assaulted. Assault has to do with wicked men, and nothing women are doing can provoke that. Thank you, Erica. Does anybody want to add anything to that? All right. Um, Becky, this is you, number four. Is there a distinction between the sexually provocative and the sensual? I ask this because I've heard people making justification for less covering, specifically legs, because it doesn't feel immodest or sexually provocative. Okay. Um, I would say that there's only a slight distinction between the two. By definition, the word sensual is really just a mild form of sexually provocative. Uh, the definition is this, when I Googled it. Relating to or involving gratification of the senses and physical, especially sexual, pleasure. I think that's the way the word is generally used. I'd say that we as Christian women don't want either of these words attached to us. As for whether or not it's no, uh, necessary to cover our legs, I'd like to make three arguments. First of all, I would argue that bare legs are sexually provocative. This is obvious to me both by the testimony of men that I've talked to, but also by the way that the world has sold women's legs. Um, Erica was mentioning this already. Commercial selling products completely unrelated to legs. In fact, especially ads that are targeting male audiences. 
Um, it's very often women in short skirts advocating for what it is that they're selling. Um, it's very influential. It's very successful. It's a ses successful way to sell things. Secondly, I'd like to ask you a question. Um, I actually got this from Erica. It was a good question. If you're uncomfortable with the current appearance of your legs, for example, if they're unshaven or if you feel they're fat, do you still want to show them? That's my question. And if, if you're not willing to show them, I would question my motivation. Um, I feel like our clothing and vanity are very, very closely related in women. So I'll just leave that at that. Third, I'd like to appeal to history. Oh, I have a, those of you that are on the Followers of the Way Ladies Local group, I'm just going to send a link here. Um, it's not very different from what Laura was showing us, but there is um, a bunch of pictures of Christian women's dress, and some of them actually seem to be men. I'm not actually sure. Some of them, but Tertullian, do you say Tertullian or Tertullian? I'm not sure now. Writes around the year 198, let a holy woman, if naturally beautiful, give no one such great a great occasion for carnal lusts, and certainly. If even she is beautiful, she should not show off her beauty, but should rather obscure it. This obviously would apply to much more than just legs, but legs would certainly be included. All through the ages, it was unacceptable for a Christian woman to show her legs. Surprisingly, even when women were less and less modest in other areas, as Laura was showing, like necklines, shoulders, legs were still considered sexually provocative and they were covered. Even as late as in the early 1920s, states like Virginia and Ohio had proposed legislation that would restrict any girl over the age of 14 from wearing a skirt, and now, quote, a skirt which does not reach to that part of the foot known as the instep, unquote. So based on that, I would go, tend to go with the conviction that was held to for 1900 years instead of going with, with what has become the norm in the last 100 years and going along with the feminist movement. I felt a little nervous answering this question because neither, I, I, I don't want to come across as judgmental about skirt lengths at all. Um, just in studying it, it seemed like, it seemed pretty safe to say we should probably just go ahead and wear long skirts, but then neither am I taking a woman that's wearing a shorter skirt than that saying, you're not modest at all. Uh, I'm just, in studying it, I would say that I, it, it confirmed my conviction that we should probably try to cover our legs. Thank you, Becky. Um, the next question, is gonna go back to Laura. How can we decide what clothes are modest? what length, style, amount of covering, etc. when different believers have different opinions. I'm thinking of different opinions among women, but especially among men who have different standards of what it means for a woman to dress modestly. Yeah, I think this is a really important question and a really hard question. Um, so, I think I would start by saying that with clothing, I think there are two ditches that we can fall into. I think there's one ditch, which is more common, of being ashamed of what God has called us to. Here we might wear a skirt or a head covering out of a check the box mentality, while we still have that lingering desire to fit into the world and to express our pride. So I think people can fit into the convictions of their church or their community, but they might add something cool to go along with it, a cool watch or shoes or boots or painting nails, whatever it is. Um, wearing a head covering that can't be seen easily or um, yeah, the shortest skirt that they can get away with before they're admonished. I think this mentality misses the heart of God. And like Becky, I don't wanna sound judgmental, but I think it misses the beautiful heart that God has for us, and that's really what I want us to see. I think the other ditch is religious pride, and this is much less common, but very real. Um, we can fall into pride in being more modest and more covered than our sisters. 
This was the sin of the Pharisees, wanting to be seen as outwardly righteous and admired for that. So I think the level ground that God wants us to walk on is one of no shame, of really seeking and embracing his heart about why does he call us to these things? What is the blessing that he has for, them, for us in them? And then doing them with our whole heart as unto the Lord. So I could tell you the length of skirt I feel comfortable with or how loose or tight a top or how big a head covering, but it would just be a mixture of my opinion and the testimony of where God has brought me. So I think a better question is to ask why. Why does God call us to cover our bodies? We've said this so far tonight, and I think it's important to say again, it's not because our bodies are shameful or dirty or they must be hidden. I think that is a message that girls can get from, from especially being preached modesty from a young age, that there's something wrong with them. I don't think that's true. It's because God made us beautiful and good, and he wants to safeguard us and protect us, either for the sanctity of marriage or for the sanctity of an undistracted single life. God loves us, and he wants to protect us from being objectified by stares and advances of men with lustful intentions. I know that he saw me as a young girl, dressed just like the world, and wanting the attention and approval of boys, and being completely unaware of the heartache that that would bring. I know that he saw me spending excessive money on clothes, and looking to be approved of, and knowing that friendships based on those grounds would never satisfy. God really cares about why we do these things. So we could ask again, why does God call us to cover our heads? I think here we have the honor of testifying to the beautiful way in which he made the world, that he made male and female, and even male leadership and women's submission, as much as that's hated in our world, is really a beautiful thing that will lead to peace and order and health when it's done with love, with hearts of love that are really resolved to follow our king. So when we choose to cover the glory that God has given us in our hair, we have the opportunity to imitate Jesus. Ultimately, he's the one who covered his glory and he did it to submit to his father wholeheartedly and to come and save us, even when it meant death on a cross. So these things that we do are yeah, they're not God being restrictive. They're not God being repressive. They're really beautiful when we see why he did them. I know that God sees when we're ashamed of what he's asked us to do, and I think it grieves him. But I think he also sees the girls and women who struggle to apply these teachings, who have been abused by men who teach them, and I think he's even more deeply grieved. He longs for us to see that he has a kind and loving heart. God's heart for us is so beautiful, and he wants each of us to find the freedom that there is in walking in these things. So I think in terms of making general applications, I think it's unhelpful to look to the world and be one or two or 10 steps behind the world because we've seen that the world is continually growing more wicked. Paul counseled the Corinthians, follow me as I follow Christ. I think a better starting place would be to find an older woman that you admire, someone that's not trying to be fashionable and not trying to be pharisaical, somebody who's content with who God made her to be, um, who follows the Bible without shame and with joy, and ask, how does she dress? How can she help me figure out my path with this? I think a process would look something like this. We can search the word for principles. We can apply those principles with an honest heart, seeking to hear from God. I think keeping yourself in the context of a faithful body of believers who are living the historic faith is important. And then actually asking people for their counsel and admonition, asking people, is this modest? What do you think of this? Am I, am I sending the wrong message here? Hebrews 12 tells us that as Jesus went to the cross, he despised the, the shame attached to it. And when the world's opinion of our dress creeps back in, I think it's important to do as Jesus did. Despise the shame. Remind yourself of the aims and ends of the world's dictates. And remind yourself of your heavenly Father who loves you and who has a good heart for you behind his commands. Why did the world want me to wear immodest clothes? Why does the world make me feel the need to buy new fashions every few months or to be admired or cool. 
The world's desire is to make money. It's to entrap and ensnare. And Satan is behind those systems, and he delights in every kind of bondage, including pride. Why does God want me to be content with what I have and covered? It's because he loves me. The world and Satan are the side that would exploit women. They propagate the lie that God's ways are repressive. God is the one who truly loves women. So I would say that when the shame comes, despise them, expose them, and remind yourself of the truth. All right, question number six is going to go to Natasha. Have you, how have you processed modesty as it pertains to drawing attention to one's person, even if it is not necessarily one's body? For example, maybe you are covered from head to toe, but you are wearing an obviously expensive dress. How can we as sisters encourage one another to walk modestly and pursue beauty that comes from the inside? Well, our clothes say something about us, whether we want them to or not. So no one here is a fashion designer, but every day when we get dressed, we design ourselves. The showiest clothes that capture attention are meant to say something about the wearer. Maybe the person is trying to be daring or extremely fashionable, influential in setting trends that others follow. Because we direct our lives towards God, we want our clothes to ultimately be directed to him as well. As far as cost goes, I think this is really important to talk about, especially in the day and age we live in concerning fast fashion and all of the implications of that. So up until the mid 20th century, the fashion industry ran on four seasons a year. We had fall, winter, spring, and summer. Designers would work many months ahead to plan for each season and predict the styles they believe customers would want. Nowadays, fast fashion brands produce 52 micro seasons a year. So that's one new collection every week. Fast fashion is a buzz phrase, but what does this term really mean? Basically, fast fashion describes a cheap, stylish, mass-produced clothes um, that have a huge impact on the environment and inhumane human rights around the world. In 2013, the world really had a reality check when a clothing manufacturing complex in Bangladesh collapsed, killing over 1,000 workers. That's when the world seemed to finally start paying attention to fast fashion and the true cost of cheap clothing. It's seen as modern as a modern form of slavery to many people. There are huge environmental factors that play into making the making and dyeing of fabrics that make our clothes, or the cheap fabric we buy to make our own clothes. But besides the environmental cost, there's a human cost. Fast fashion impacts garment workers who work in dangerous environments for very low wages without fundamental human rights. And further down the supply chain, farmers may work with toxic chemicals and brutal practices that can have terrible impacts to their physical as well as mental health. So buying secondhand is a wonderful way to combat this. Even sewing your own clothing from pre-owned sheets or fabric from thrift stores or garage sales. Uh, but if you are buying new items, just doing a little research to find out if what you are buying is ethical can go a long way. All this to say, besides buying secondhand, this is going to cost more. And personally, I would see the cost of buying a quality item that's ethically made that will last you many years is a really good investment if you're able to do that. So through us, clothes can speak about virtues such as fortitude, prudence, temperance, and justice. So buy well, choose well, and make it last. The second part of this question was how can we as sisters in Christ encourage one another to walk modestly and pursue beauty that comes from the inside? I have four specific ways that we can encourage each other. So the first, 
is pray that God would make you an encourager. Ask him to give you a heart that loves others in creativity to know how to show it. Ask him to give you a desire to build others up. Number two, study the different people from the Bible. Like Barnabas, as an example. Barnabas means son of encouragement. He was a great man of conviction who wanted to see the church flourish and did all that he could to make it happen. Number three, use scripture. Nothing encourages us like the promises from God's word. And number four, be specific with your sisters. You can do this by practicing radical candor. Caring personally while challenging directly. Being kind and clear, but specific and sincere. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to remind you guys that we are going to open it up um, for an open Q&A when we're done. So if you have questions, just be thinking about them. Um, question number seven for Becky. Um, are there areas, are there any areas where we, Kingdom Sisters, who care about and practice modesty, commonly are negligent or unaware and fall into immodesty? Any specific areas that you would like to see sisters taking more care in? So this is a scary question to answer. Um, I don't have any desire to discourage anyone, to make anybody feel like there's no right way to dress. Sometimes if too many specifics are brought up, it seems like, well, how am I even going to dress, right? Here's some things that I've had to watch, watch for, and I've seen, um, not necessarily here in Boston, but among Christian women in general, that that make it an effort to practice modesty. I also asked several ladies, including the ladies on the panel, just on some, some things that they thought should be said. And here's a few that I came up with then. I think most, of it, I want to qualify this, most of these things are done unintentionally. And so, first one is clinging clothing, especially around the chest or the bum area. Certain fabrics are worse for this, and it's just something to watch for. I know buying clothing can be really difficult because women's clothing in general is specifically meant to accentuate and reveal a woman's body. And so it's worth being careful about the fabrics we choose and the cut of clothes we buy. Evidently, this was an age-old problem. Clement of Alexandria wrote, for luxurious clothing, which cannot conceal the shape of the body, is no more covering. For such clothing, falling close to the body takes its form more easily and adhering, as it were, to the flesh, receives its shape and marks out the woman's figure so that the whole make of the body is visible to spectators, though not seeing the body itself. So not a new thing. Christian women have always faced this. It, it can be difficult, but it's just something to watch for. Another one is that when we sit down, a skirt can be too short, or both a skirt or a top can pull around and accentuate in ways that we didn't even realize. I find that if I'm standing in front of a full-length mirror, you know, you stand there, you're standing straight, you kind of arrange the clothing, and it seems nice, like it looks fine. Sometimes I'll put on the new thing that I bought and um, wear it for an hour about the house and ask my husband to critique it. Just what does it look like as I'm moving around, as I'm doing my regular duties? And sometimes it turns out that it wasn't so modest after all. It kind of just clings in ways that I didn't see when I was just standing there. So I'd say invite input. If you have a husband or a sister in Christ that you can ask, just we can't always see what we look like. So ask others. Necklines are another thing to consider. Um, it can look fine, again, standing straight up in front of a mirror. And then sometimes, just because of the cut, I don't know why it is for sure, but you bend over and all of a sudden, a lot more is seen that you'd, than you'd, we'd prefer to be seen. None of us want to be showing cleavage. No, I don't suspect any Christian woman of wishing to do that, but it happens sometimes, so it's just something to check. Um, it can be pretty easy to slip back into old patterns and try to be pretty, arrange hair and kind of just stick our head coverings on top of it. And, you know, put curls around our faces to soften the face. I understand all of those things. I mean, it's just easy to slip back into old patterns. And so 
We just have to watch ourselves. Most of all, as I said in my testimony, we just need to be wide open with God and ourselves. There's no way for there to be enough guidelines to be made so that a woman would always, to ensure modesty, just be, uh, be sensitive to what the Spirit might be saying to you about what you wear. Ask yourself honest questions about your motivations of why you are wearing certain things. God is always just so faithful to um, in providing answers when we truly and sincerely want to know. And like I said, find people that you feel comfortable with critiquing your clothing and have that open relationship. I always thought this should be an open topic where we can freely say, hey, you may not want to wear that. It, you just... And it doesn't cause hurt feelings. It's that we're helping one another. I also think it's very important that we ask the right questions. Um, instead of asking, how much can I get away with and still be considered modest? We need to be asking, how can I best glorify God in my dress? So if you go downtown Boston, like what do we want people to see? Do we want them to see someone who has a knack for dressing really cute? There is some glory in that, you know? Or do we want people to look at us and wonder, what is it about her that's so different? Thank you, Becky. Does anybody else want to add anything to that? No? All right, um, question number eight for Laura. Are there specific applications of modesty, certain length of skirt, women avoiding pants that aren't spelled out in scripture, but you still feel confident we should hold to and tell new disciples that they need to hold to in order to be following Jesus? Yeah, this is another really good question. Um, I do feel that women wearing dresses and skirts is part of the testimony of a God-fearing and honoring woman. I think it may be helpful to note that there are other applications that basically any Christian would agree to that are also applications that aren't spelled out in scripture. For example, opposing slavery is something that we all agree to that's not spelled out in scripture. Another one would be not watching sexually explicit or violent entertainment. I think women not wearing pants is another one of these applications. So the first principle I think is gender distinction. In the beginning, Genesis tells us God made them male and female. He gave Adam and Eve different tasks, and when he cursed them, he gave them different curses. Deuteronomy 22.5, again, stresses gender distinction. It tells us that a woman should not wear a man's garment, nor should a man wear a woman's cloak. For whoever does these things is an abomination to the Lord your God. And it would be one thing to see this just in the Old Testament, but the principle is reiterated in the New Testament that men and women are to be different. Men are to have short hair and no head covering. Women are to have long hair and a head covering. And we know that male and female roles are different in the Old Testament and the New Testament. So when God made the world, he purposely designed two different types of people, male and female. I think gender distinction is important to God and it should be important to us too. If there was ever a time in the history of the world where God's creation of male and female were under attack, it's today. I used to have to convince people of this, and now it's in our faces everywhere. We've gone from unisex clothing to choosing our pronouns to men choosing to be women and women choosing to be men. By choosing to dress as a woman in a specifically feminine way, we vote and we testify with our actions that we agree with God. We choose to embrace the way he made the world, and we say that it's good. I think in a Western context, the most straightforward way to testify to being a woman is to wear a dress or a skirt. The designers of bathroom doors still know this, and we all know how to follow their signs. The sign for a man is pants, and the sign for a woman is a dress. And likewise, when women in the world want to dress up, even women who wear pants 362 days of the year, they put on a dress to go to a wedding or a formal event. And the exception, when a woman wears a pantsuit to you know, some red carpet event, um, it's a feminist statement that's strong enough that it makes news, it makes headlines, even today. It's true to some extent that there's not one type of universal female dress. We already looked at the salwar kameez in India where the woman is wearing pants 
pants, with a tunic. She has something between her legs. And I would never say that women can't wear anything between their legs. I think what I would say is that we want to wear the female dress of our culture in order to testify that the way that God made the world is good. In the West, the history of pants is really interesting and the history of women wearing pants. So it started in 1851 with a woman named Elizabeth Smith Miller and Amelia Bloomer, from whose name we get the word bloomers, soon jumped on the bandwagon. They wanted to bring about a reform in women's dress. And I think there are a lot of good things about this, honestly. They advocated something they called the Turkish costume or the reform outfit, and it was a loose dress with no corset underneath. And it went to about mid-calf, and then it had loose pants underneath. And the idea was to free women from the corset and the damage that that did to their bodies and also from wearing excessively long skirts that were like dragging on the ground and bringing manure and dirt into homes. It was adopted by women who were campaigning for women's right to vote, and so it was seen as too radical. Women were actually arrested for wearing this in New York City in the 1850s. And so it was abandoned or forgotten after the Civil War. But I do think there's a lot of good in this. It's absolutely true. The corset was damaging to women's bodies. It was playing to an unrealistic and contrived image of beauty, and I'm glad that it's no longer around. The next wave of women who wore pants were largely cutting-edge artists and feminists and also living in lesbian relationships. Um, in the 1830s in Paris, there was an artist named... Oh, actually, sorry, I'm going to go back. In the eight, there was a woman named... Amantine Dupin, who was an author. She wrote under the male pen name Georges Sand. She wore, women, she wore men's pantsuits, and she lived in a lifestyle with numerous lovers, including at least one homosexual relationship. Another artist, Rosa Bonheur, was a painter who also lived in Paris from 1820 to 1899. And she dressed as a man to enter, so she wore pants to enter the male-only um, arena of slaughterhouses because she wanted to learn to paint animals realistically, so she wanted to see the muscular and skeletal structure. But she also lived in a lesbian relationship, and she was the man of that relationship. She was the breadwinner, and her female partner, whose name was Natalie Mikas, um, kept their home. And then finally, there's Gertrude Stein, who was an American poet who lived in Paris for much of her career. She died in 1946. And she wore pants. She had a men's haircut of about an inch long, even in the 20s. She was painted by Picasso. Her wife, Alice B. Toklas, kept a feminine persona, wore dresses, and was a homemaker. These are the pioneers of women who wore pants. And so the question I would ask is, are these the examples we want to follow? Ultimately, our world today is more than ever at war over the issue of gender. And there really is not neutral ground. We have to take a side. I think the question should not be, are Christian women forbidden to wear pants? Rather, I think the question would be, which side do you want to fight for? All right, thank you, Laura. Um, question number nine is for Erica. I am passionate about not wearing makeup and feeling beautiful and sufficient with the way God made me for many reasons, which I'm sure you all, dis you all will discuss at length, including believing that God does make things good, not becoming a slave to worldly concepts of beauty, not presenting a false image of myself and more. Recently, though, I started to feel like other things I was doing, though not altering my appearance as dramatically as makeup, were still in some ways violating some of these principles. These behaviors include shaving legs, armpits, and plucking stray eyebrow or unibrow hairs. I'd be very interested to hear your opinion about these subtler issues. Maybe one way of framing the question more succinctly would be, how do you draw the line between hygiene and immodest practice of changing your appearance? A related concept could also be, how do you think about health problems that have outward consequences that we might want to modify? Should a woman who has PCOS feel at liberty to remove her mustache beard hair? What about acne, warts, scars, and the like? Uh, 
Um, I'm going to answer the first question here. How do you draw a line between hygiene and the immodest practice of of changing your appearance? And I'm going to talk about shaving. Um, So when I looked up hygiene, it's defined as cleanliness to maintain health and prevent diseases. And most things surrounding hygiene, I mean everything, I, I could not find a different definition that that wasn't directly relating to diseases and health. So um, for whatever reasons you choose to shave your legs, I would cross hygiene off the list. Um, And my husband's always like, what does that say about me? You know, am I dirty? Like I have hairy legs, like I'm not dirty. Um, And we have hair on other parts of our bodies and we don't call that dirty or unhygienic. And so like who gets to decide this hair you can clean this hair with soap, but this hair remains, you know, dirty or whatever. So, um, as surrounding shaving, um, you know, when Adam looked at Eve and this woman was made perfectly for him, I cannot imagine him saying, oh man, she's so beautiful if she would pluck her eyebrows or she would be so pretty if she didn't have that hair on her legs. Um, our, our sons would not expect that either when they see these lives created for them. Have they, had they not been exposed to this sexualized advertising, had they not been exposed to pornography and magazines and billboards, um, I, I don't want to teach my sons to expect that. And our daughters would not expect that. Um, I don't believe that a daughter not exposed to those influences would wake up one day and say, you know what, I don't. I think these things are bad. I want to. I want to shave. Um, the the other thing with eyebrows I find fascinating is I've watched these trends change so much. I watched women spend ten years plucking their eyebrows so thin that they don't have eyebrows anymore, and now the trend is bushy eyebrows. And now I see these same women trying to draw their eyebrows on with pencils. So I always tell people, this is what I tell my daughters, hang tight, it'll be cool in 10 years. <laughs> like, just, <laughs> just wait it out. Um, and so if beauty standards change that much, who gets to decide? And why can't we just let God decide and let this version be the pretty version? Um, um, let me see here. <laughs> So, yeah, it's only cultural. Shaving is a cultural thing, and it's only weird to have body hair because advertisers in Hollywood and personal experience with seeing other shaved legs had told us that it's weird. The next question, um, a related concept would be, how do you think about health problems that have outward consequences that we might try to modify? I don't have a lot of, you know, strong biblical answers here. I just have a personal testimony. Um, I like One thing that made me think was when my daughter had a head injury, they chose to send her to a plastic surgeon so that the scar would be invisible or as invisible as possible. I don't think that's vanity. I think that's restoration. It's trying to restore her body to how it was made. Um, And I think that's been a big difference for me and as I question my own life. um, I recently had a tooth replaced that I previously chose not to. I had a front missing tooth for most of my life, for over 25 years. Um, I had a surgery that removed four teeth as a teenager, probably more like 12. For whatever reason, the insurance company gave my dad the money. that was supposed to go to the surgeon. And my dad's an addict, and he used the money. And so I was left in this state without having my future surgeries that I needed. Um, I, I decided to focus on being a mom, and and as I got rid of makeup and, and repented of vanity, I just left that be for many years. Um, My dad died from his addiction four days after Galilee was born. And I decided I was going to restore that part of my body and return to, you know, how God wanted it. And I think the same is true for things like scars that likely carry a lot of trauma. I think scars was mentioned there. 
I think it's a very personal decision to walk through and choose whether to have surgery to be restored, regardless of their location. Um, I've had the same questions over my tattoo. Should I remove it or not? Um, I ultimately decided to leave it. I know some Christians do remove tattoos, especially when they're on their face. I battled for a while and decided it's just part of my story and who I am, and that's a scar that I'll just let stay. For things like polycystic ovary disease, acne warts, I would, I would advocate getting them treated medically. I think those are medical issues. A few pimples here and there is normal. Um, painful acne or a rash covering your face is not, and I would treat that like I would a rash anywhere else on my body. I, when, when looking up how to treat that, um, I found a quote here. I actually don't see it. But dermatologist was saying, you know, don't put makeup on. Don't cover, don't cover your clogged pores. Let them heal. And so I, I do think that covering them um, is not a good option, even for the world, even if you didn't have a vanity concern there. Things like warts, I remove my children's warts. They're viruses. They're contagious. Um, they can bleed. They can be painful. Freckles and moles and small differences are a normal part of humanity. I generally ask myself back to my husband, is my husband concerned with his pimple or his freckle or his whatever. Um, we, don't, we don't really have a lot of thought for men aren't going around trying to cover up these issues on their faces. And I don't think we need to either. We're human just like they're human and we can accept that. Um, yeah, I think that's, I think that's pretty much the, the question. Okay, last question here to Natasha. I would love ideas about how to think about modesty for young children. I'm thinking like the toddler preschool age. What are tips for deciding what's appropriate for them? Do modesty levels differ, differ depending on the age of the child? Is this something to worry about for young children? Well, the profession of motherhood is a very high and holy calling. And we have an awesome opportunity to lead our children by our words and by our example. And children learn so much by observing others. I know mine do, that's for sure. So we need to ask ourselves, what are they observing? And not to shy away from hard conversations. I have a few children, one specific that I'm thinking about that asks me very direct questions about modesty, and it really surprises me, especially at her age. Um, but every child is different and has a unique personality. Some might never question the clothes they wear, while others might question everything. So we don't want to focus, we don't want our, our main focus to be clothes. At least that's not what I want my focus to be um, in motherhood. I don't want my children to always be thinking about clothes and what they're wearing and what other people are wearing. So it's important to reassure our children um, that clothes are not something that they need to worry about. And I love sharing this scripture, Matthew 6, 26 through 34, look at the birds of the air, for they neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? Which of you, by worrying, can add one cubit to his stature? So why do you worry about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. And yet I say to you that even Solomon in all of his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Now if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not more clothe you? Oh, you of little faith. Therefore, do not worry, saying, what shall we eat? What shall we drink? What shall we wear? For after all these things the Gentiles seek. 
For your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about its own things. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. Our children can rest in these words. I think we can rest in these words too. And um, again, I have seven girls, and I did not grow up dressing modestly. So I'm raising many girls with convictions that my husband and I have come to as adults. And I have certainly not done things perfectly. I'm still growing. I'm still learning. So I hope you guys have grace with me and <laughs> as, I'm, as I'm raising my girls. But I would say that we should dress our children in clothes that we would feel comfortable wearing for the most part. Um, modesty is for both male and female. We're not talking about male modesty. We're talking about female modesty, but we do have some boy children. Um, my husband has a conviction to not wear shorts. So my boys don't wear shorts. Obviously, there's some wiggle room, you know, with young children as they're learning to crawl and walk and whatnot. But I would say that those are my thoughts regarding children and modesty. And if anyone has anything else to add, here's the mic. <laughs> Okay, so that was the last of our question. Our questions, we are just a couple minutes till nine. Today's world, there is a massive attack on body image and beauty, and um, it can be really challenging to know how to navigate through it all. And it's something that we have all struggled with. And so we don't want this just to be like a one and done thing. If you have struggles, you have questions, please reach out. Let's keep this an open conversation, continue to work through this, and then I hope that we can all deepen our convictions as we seek to ground our identity on how God sees us.